Hi, and welcome to How Humans Heal. I'm Dr. Donnie Wilson, and I'm really looking forward to introducing you today to Dr. Rob Whitfield. He is an expert plastic surgeon who's helped thousands of women with explant surgery from breast implant illness, and he is the author of the book SHARP, Strategic Holistic Accelerated Recovery Program, as well as the host of the podcast, Breast Implant Illness. So I'm really so glad you're here to join us today, Rob, and share with us about your expertise in this area. I'm excited to be here. Ever since we got together in Boston to have a chat about this, I've been looking forward to it. And uh, so let's uh, dig right in. Absolutely. I mean, that's quite a lot of experience you've had of helping women through this process. And and I have to think that when you get such an up-close look at the damage can be happening in a person's body, I mean, not just from potentially breast implants, but other toxins that we're exposed to, is that what's motivated you to really now take this stance of helping people to not only recover from breast implant illness, but also improve their health and longevity long term? Sure. Uh, first of all, you know, I, I certainly thank you for having me on and, and welcome, you know, listening and uh, participating in this with your audience. So my background is oncology. So I did a specific type of breast cancer reconstruction, and then I did other forms of reconstruction for sarcoma and head and neck cancer. And so during that, you know, there are some fundamental principles in plastic surgery where are trying to take tissue or different types of tissue in a uh, composite, which we call a flap, and you leave that connected to blood vessels. So you it acts like a transplant of your own tissue, which means it's autologous, which means your body won't reject it provided uh, from our standpoint, reestablishing blood flow or sensation if it's going to have sensation. So you need to hook up an artery and a vein. And once again, if it's going to be a, a sensory reconstruction, you hook up a nerve as well. And so that was what I did um, for almost 19 years of my career. And microsurgery is what that would uh, require. So you'd have to use a microscope in the operating room and spend many, many hours creating the tissue composite based on whatever defect or, or um, excision, you know, was left by the on oncologic surgeon. So in breast cancer, when they would do a mastectomy in sarcoma, I mean, many times they would take out some, a portion of someone's femur, their thigh bone or, or their lower leg bone or their joint. And I'd come in and there'd be these huge, uh, wounds and these uh, prosthetics, and then <laughs> so, that's that, amazing that it's even possible to reconstruct, rebuild the human body in that way. Right. So the point is, all of those reconstructions that we couldn't accomplish with your own tissue required support from an implant. So if it was a sarcoma and it was involving your knee joints, you know they would have to use a cadaver bone or a prosthetic. Um, and so I've, the point is I've dealt with this in a number of scenarios through cancer reconstruction. So whether it's with the neurosurgeons or the, uh, head and neck surgeons, the, you know, I've taken care of people after, uh, cardiac surgery who have gotten infection in their breastbone. Yeah. I mean, whatever you name it, I've, I've had to help take care of it, which is fine. I knew from people that got referred to me with breast implant reconstruction problems that, you know, and, and not to simplify it, but if I took out the implant and all of the, you know, scar tissue or residual uh, scar and started, you know, over, if you will, and used their own tissue, then there would be zero chance provided I got everything functioning from a blood flow standpoint properly that they would reject it because it's their own tissue. It's not possible to reject it. So um, before I knew kind of what this mystery illness of breast implant illness was, I was doing that for patients anyway who had injuries from or problems with their implants from radiation treatments or got an infection while they were getting chemotherapy or just were uncomfortable, had pain or capsule contracture. There's a host of, of, of reasons. Some people just want to go flat. In 2016, I had a patient come uh, to me in Austin to say, hey, you know, I'm just tired of having this reconstruction. I don't want anything done. 
can you take it down? And um, I said, I said, sure. And this was my first patient who I took um, down the reconstruction. We sent off the specimens to make sure there's no cancer, make sure there's no um, bacteria. And she came back and had an E. coli infection. So I believe it was her who put me on a fi- uh, Facebook group that I did explant surgery. And so all of a sudden, I just had people start calling my office asking for explant surgery. And, you know, fast forward now, we've done several thousand. And I haven't placed implants for a long period of time, not because uh, they don't have their, you know, quote unquote place, but I'm really about trying to help resolve this, you know, problem. And and I like using someone's own tissue. So I like fat transfers. I don't do the flap surgeries anymore. A little, that's a little beyond me now. I'm a little, so those surgeries are long and my neck's old. So I just take care of my body now. Yeah, yeah. And it sounds like it's, yeah, like you have to be doing like microscopic work, you know, uh, sewing the body back together again. And and at the same time, that experience, I'm sure, really helps with with dealing with breast implant illness because, and this, as you've kind of alluded to, this is still even becoming more of an established diagnosis. A lot of women are, I think, going years without realizing that the breast implants could be causing health issues. Do you see that? Do you see women coming to you where they've been struggling with symptoms and finally figuring out that it could be caused by the implants? Sure. And the way I explain breast implant illness, because it's it's not something that has a specific diagnosis code. You know, I consider it a chronic inflammatory process of which a breast implant is a component. And for all your listeners, we have several thousand instances of where someone has impaired genetic detoxification genetically, and then they have a large tox burden. So when you look at their urine toxicity profile, you'll see environmental toxins like phthalates, bifosates, triclosan, MEPs, BPAs, so parabens, things things that you get out of feminine products or cosmetics. Um, And then... Heavy metals uh, can be seen on reports. I've had patients, um, uh, one of my patients, very famous, Lauren Bostick, the Skinny Confidential podcaster. She had um, used a barrel sauna that got up to around 212 or 220 degrees Fahrenheit. So she had leaching from her implants, not melting, but leaching from her implants. And that would give her a high, high a number of heavy metals uh, in her tox profile. And then, of course, you know, I've seen every bloody type of mycotoxin you can imagine. Um, uh, it's a really underappreciated problem. And although I don't have testing that we do for Lyme up front, we do have a lot of suspicious cases where people still have and suffer from, you know, those types of chronic uh, inflammatory symptoms associated with mold and Lyme. Absolutely. Yeah. I really find that too, that a lot of times people are, you know, I'm identifying the mold toxicity uh, even after they've seen many other practitioners and right. and even related to the breast implants, right? Like it's specifically, there's a connection between the implants and the likelihood of, um, of mold toxicity. Now, I think from what we look at and know about from functional genetics, if if someone is one of our clients and they're coming to see me for breast implant issues, you know, several hypotheses exist about their genetics. One, they typically all have vitamin D metabolism issues almost universally. Interesting. And, uh, invariably, they have either methylation problems or antioxidant problems or glutathione metabolism problems. So, mm-hmm. of those four things I mentioned, Three of the four in whatever combination are usually present. And then, of course, you would imagine the worst of all those is all four are present. And then you add in a little estrogen toxicity, and that is the soup that makes you very sick. And and this is a really important point in that, like, by the time someone realizes they need to get the explant, they're really not feeling well. And now they're coming to you saying, okay, I want to get this explant done. And yet what I find is that it's really important for people to prepare for the surgery and then recover from the surgery because it's not as simple as just taking out the explant, the the implants. It's, we have to be 
then it sort of like initiates in the body this detoxification process. And I know this is something that you also talk about in your book and you offer support with in your practice is how to help women, not just with the surgery, but the, the recovery from the whole toxicity situation. Yeah, I think the the reason we got more and more interested in it is folks with uh, mold or folks who just wouldn't recover and it was I, it was confusing to me, and then through just uh, better understanding about genetics, like uh, many times, for the audience there's something called a single nucleotide polymorphism or a SNP, and MTHFR is you know now kind of a commonly discussed uh, SNP. We we all assumed that that was part of it, but we also were assuming some things that weren't accurate. Um, and then when you look at all those combinations that we discussed earlier, they all have SNPs. There's, there's, you know, a number of them, obviously. And when you have those and take into consideration, abner you know, abnormalities in estrogen metabolism, then it makes sense. And so when you have all that upfront information, the things that we try to, or the levers we try to, to modify as much as we can in the sharp uh, method is your air quality. You know, we, we discuss air filtration because mold spores are a big problem in our clients. So we want the highest air quality. So air filtration with like Jasper filters is good. Air filtration with uh, IQ air is good. So it has to be a very high quality uh, filter, not your HEPA filter in your house. Then, you know, when we, everybody kind of understands filtered water. I, I don't think that's that complex. I just ask people not to drink out of plastic, you know, just use glass or obviously, you know, stainless, one of these, you know, uh, that you're not getting other chemicals out of. And then food, oh boy, I have people with a lot of absorptive problems. So we use liposomal formulations in my supplement line for glutathione, vitamin D3, K2, methylated Bs and antioxidants. And then Try to get them on a seed oil free, gluten free, dairy free diet, higher in protein. We use a, a plant based protein in my practice so that, you know, all of my clients can use it. It's not um, going to be uh, difficult for anybody to use it. And then the others, you know, hacks we try to do up front in addition to working with them on detox is get their sleep better. Um, women have, uh, obviously, uh, I think a lot more sleep disturbance because they have a lot less testosterone to buffer out cortisol and estrogen and they don't get it as much. They don't get into deep sleep and stay there long enough, I would say. So, you know, quality and quantity is not enough in terms of deep sleep for them. So their ability to get growth hormone release while they're asleep to get uh, good, if you want to think, uh, the lymphatic around the brain. Uh, that system to, you know, clean everything out and, and make it all good for the next day. Lots of, lots of work. And uh, starting that soon as I meet someone um, it is how we try to get, um, I, I would say, the sooner you can do that, they, you're going to get yourself in a better situation. So it's not going to be an abrupt uh, you know, change. These are all, you know, smaller changes we can make just by paying attention to what we're doing. Yeah, it's absolutely. And it's sometimes it seems so simple, right? And yet I love hearing you say like, this is the foundation of where you begin. It's like, let's come back to how we detoxify, right? Even And especially someone who has those gene variations that you're mentioning, it's essential to come back to these basics because it, that's those those toxins end up just causing traffic jams in these metabolic pathways, especially with someone who has the gene variation. So we have to, that's how I talk about it is like, we have to clear up those traffic jams. And one of the best ways to clear the traffic jams is reduce your toxin exposure in your air and your water and your food. And, and then to, like you're saying, start doing, you know, the daily things like sleep and, and um, you know, taking care of ourselves as well during the day that helps our body to just have our natural detoxification processes working better, right? I love that. Like, you're like, hey, let's just get your natural detoxification pathways working before we even 
go into trying to push detoxification pathways? And I, my, my clients, once they figure things out, I think many times they'll get really aggressive, not on what we were just talking about, but other modalities like sauna. So sauna is not great for my patient population. IR saunas get warm and they penetrate deeply. And then barrel saunas get extremely hot and necessarily they, they don't penetrate that deeply. But warming has its, in our patients, leads to more Herxenheimer type situations than um, beneficial situations. So our, my preference is to just pause sauna or heat based treatment until about 90 days after explant and then resume it, but at a, at a much more conservative uh, manner. I, I just, leaching happens when you increase temperature in, um, I, I get all of these, these, uh, you know, cases that say, oh, you know, I don't feel good. If I get too hot, I don't feel good. If I go in the sauna, I don't feel good. If I, I do my, you know, infrared, I don't feel good. I'm like, what the hell? Well, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. doesn't feel good. Let's listen to your body. Yeah. No, it's not. It's nobody. I probably have, you know, probably the, the only the series of people with heavy metal toxicities on uh, tox tests that did barrel saunas. So I, I don't, you know, and I take a bunch of criticism, which is fine. I don't care. Um, it's pretty obvious when you talk to them. It, it's a heat-based reaction. So, and when I explain them, you know, those people in particular, they have that kind of epiphany where in recovery, they feel really good. And then day over day afterwards, they feel really good. And I just did a podcast with one of them. Um, it'll be up shortly. And, you know, I don't ever tell anybody they're going to feel great uh, right after surgery. But this particular set of people who have this problem, who then explant, they do feel quite a bit different. And so I think that goes to just... There's all those reports about what tin does to you and all those, you know, they're, it's not good to have heavy metals leached into your system. Your body's not set up for that at all. I've done a lot of detoxes over the years and many of them made me feel a lot worse. Not only that, but I've had a lot of patients come in and tell me how after doing a detox, they have a stomach ache and headache and they can't sleep and they're feeling anxious. And I'm like, I can't just recommend that my patients do a program that's going to make them feel worse. So I finally decided to design my own detox program. It's a 14-day detox program that's not like other detox programs out there in several ways. One is that I'm focused on helping you to get the toxins out in a safe and effective way using nutrients, antioxidants, and supporting our natural detoxification pathways in the body. Also, I'm helping you to decrease your exposure to toxins by learning the ways that you've been exposed to toxins and how to change your day-to-day -day lifestyle to decrease your toxins over time. And I'm helping you to look not just at chemical environmental toxins, but also emotional and energetic toxicity. And yes, it's possible to accomplish all of this in 14 days. I have so many patients who have done the 14 day detox and report back to me how much better they feel. And I think it's also because I help you to know what to eat. You are getting adequate food that tastes good, plus protein shakes that I developed that are good for your body, that your body knows how to use these nutrients and take them in and use them to help you safely detoxify without feeling worse. Also, I help you to balance your blood sugar levels, get better sleep, and introduce things like meditation, biofeedback, and other types of stress recovery into your day-to-day -day routine. So I just am so excited about it. I want to make sure you know about this 14-day detox, I'm going to put the link. You can find it at drdonnie.com forward slash detox dash program. But I'll also put the link below so you can find the 14-day detox program at drdonnie.com. 
I look forward to guiding you through this detox so that you can actually feel better on your way to better health. Absolutely not. And yet I this is, you know, I hear you kind of, you know, alluding to like this is not the standard medical approach, you know. So most people like people just to know, like if it's no wonder that you might be seeing, you know, going to your internist or other practitioners and they might not be at all aware that this is even something to pay attention to. No, it's a pretty complex mixture for patients. I, I don't you know, I tell patients too, I'm like, don't don't be upset at the GP for not understanding what's going on with you. You're not exactly a straightforward case, you know, so mm -hmm. uh, the standard conventional medical testing is not going to highlight this. The, the reason it makes sense to me is because I've listened to thousands of people describe the same, you know, series of sequences and or experiences and then i understand really well the genetic predisposition so then basically um getting that confirmation through testing for their you know genetics and then looking at their tox test which i find very valuable um i feel like that's the the kind of rubber meets the road in that setting so that when and especially if someone's not feeling well you know, after several months of detox work, and we use Cellcore for detox, and I have a whole team that does that. And I'll, I'll, you know, we'll pull up their test, and maybe they had a bunch of mycotoxins or what have you. And I'll say, you need to repeat this test because, you know, is it getting better? I don't, you know, none of us know that. You're saying you don't feel well. A lot of people don't feel well when they're doing detox work because it's hard work, it's not easy. Uh, getting, you know, drainage pathways open, getting liver functioning better, you know, having, you know, daily, if not two a day bowel movements. I mean, that's a lot of, of work. Some people chronically constipated, they don't even know that. So to get themselves into a situation where they can actually feel better requires a lot of effort, you know, on their part. It does. It does. And I, I guide my patients with that too. So I know exactly what you mean and it's, but it's so worth it because, and it, but it does take a team to say, okay, let's get your bowels moving. Let's get your system, you know, working and let's get, get you through this process to, and the talks, I agree with you to be able to just see a toxin panel and actually see the toxins that are high. It's so validating, you know, to be able to see it. And then it also helps us as practitioners, because of course, different toxins require different different methods, different processes, right? Glutathione is going to work better for some things than others. And so I always say, you know, it's so worth it to do these panels because then we know what we're aiming at. We know what we need to do to get it out instead of just a general detox, which may not take into account your genetics or the specific toxins we're dealing with. Yeah, for patients that work with me now, um, I've become um, pretty inflexible about what I'll do. So if you're going to, you know, come to Austin and spend a week here and have, you know, an explant, you're going to do these things and they require your genetic testing, toxicity testing, your gut health, your food sensitivities and your hormones. And I, I think you know, people get frustrated, but. It makes sense to me. I th I completely agree. That's essential because otherwise you're not really doing them a service. You you're giving right. them a partial, quick fix. It's not really a fix. Well, I I think the misconception is that surgery is going to solve that problem. And I've done thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of case. And uh, I Rob am the greatest promoter of acute inflammation walking. Like I operate on people for a living. So I create inflammation. So um, if you haven't adopted, you know, what we want to do as a process, you're really going to have a challenge when I get a hold of you in the operating room because I'm not going to make that better. I'm going to give you now acute inflammation superimposed on chronic inflammation. And if we haven't started, you know, our process to help you get prepared for that, then it's just yet another burden you know, for you to deal with. Yeah, inflammation. And it's, that's the thing is inflammation is the thing that I think probably more than anything, you know, 
especially when you combine that with toxins, bogs down these metabolic pathways. So it makes sense. like Because an inflammation a lot of times feels kind of like this ambiguous thing to people, you know, like what does that mean, inflammation? But we see it, of course, as practitioners, we can see it clearly in a patient's symptoms. We can see it in their lab work. We can see it in their, you know, in their metabolism. And it makes such a difference when we can get that inflammation to come down. So what you're saying is, hey, let's drop the chronic inflammation so that when we bring in some acute inflammation, we're not overflowing. We're not pushing yeah. everything over the top. To the best of our ability. I mean, it, it's already a big burden. Um, you know, one, psychologically, you have to get people prepared for big appearance change. And then all the physical manifestations that go along with having surgery. People are traveling to see me. Uh, people come from Asia and Europe and obviously the continental United States and Hawaii and Alaska and all, you know, all the places, Puerto Rico and uh well, because it's worth it to, to to work with a surgeon who understands what's going on and how to do this in a safe and effective way. Yeah, I feel like, you know, the surgical part we have, um, we have a great anesthesia group who really takes care of patients well. They do a lot of nerve blocks and really minimize, if not uh, completely eliminate the need for anything uh, long acting in terms of narcotics. Our patients don't really wake up having problems with Nausea, that's not a thing, fortunately. Um, we do early recovery after surgery protocols on all the patients. So they all start specific things the night before with uh, an anti-nausea medicine, something to reduce inflammation, something to calm the, the nervous system. And then, you know, we form nerve blocks in addition to the anesthesia nerve blocks in the operating room. So our goal was to get people at like uh, two to four on wake up in terms of, you know, discomfort. And then... They have, if they need, uh, you know, oral medicine, they have it, obviously. And then the next day, um, they come here to the office in Austin, and we have a hyperbaric chamber, we have red light, and we have, we have a really uh, great set of lymphatic massage devices from New Zealand called Flopresso. And they get people into really a good parasympathetic state. And although you can see kind of off to my side, a nano V. So there's a nano V next to every one of them. So we're doing many, many things to, you know, promote really early recovery. So tissue regeneration and reduced inflammation and improved, you know, oxygenation, the tissues and reducing swelling by the diet and supplements and lymphatic massage, and then, you know, promoting really good hormones, uh, hormone levels with red light therapy. Um, and so all the things we can do, you know, in addition, we have this great relationship with a restaurant here that's gluten-free, dairy-free, and sea oil-free. So uh, although it's, you know, a chore to come here, it's not that bad. Also, it's not that bad. Yeah. <laughs> in the middle. <laughs> Sorry. Right. It's a good place. So we're... Uh, no, that's awesome. I think it's um I just am so grateful that you you know that you're offering this support for women who are in this situation of and realizing, hey, I need to do something about this. Like cause when usually this comes up, it's like you hit a point where it's become clear that this is like needs to be dealt with and um, you know, at that point, then you don't want to have to be waiting longer or feeling worse. You want to be able to get through it. And that's so awesome that I'm so glad you have your book that that's, you know, also going to be such a great, you know, guide and manual for people who are going through this and recovering from it. I'm also I wanted to ask you one thing that I because I specialize in helping women who have abnormal pap smears and risk of cervical cancer. And so I, one thing that I'm seeing is also a correlation. And I, because I, I'm mostly seeing it from this side. So not all of my patients have breast implants or breast implant illness, but I am seeing some correlation where it seems to be that there's also this connection between HPV showing up right when a woman's dealing also with breast implant illness. So I'm, I don't know if that's something that you've observed or um, just something now we could pay attention to and kind of notice if we see that correlating. Yeah, I, I would say that um, anything that affects NK cells will affect that. And we know that many of our patients experience 
in case cell suppression. I did a podcast with a patient of mine, Taylor Dukes, um, and she had a brain tumor and um, just a completely uh, undiagnosed uh, tumor found on a Pernovo scan. <clears throat> and um, she went to a holistic oncologist and of course they tested her levels and she was on my show and we hadn't really uh, done a lot of prep for the show and she kind of harked back to her console <laughs> and I, I remember she's like, oh, you know, I had this brain server and we had no idea and I said, well, you probably had a really suppressed NK level. And she's like, yeah, how'd you know? I was like, well, people your age who get tumors, I mean, that's basically part of the, the programming. So it's not that we have all the direct cause and effect. So everybody listening, you know, in full disclosure, I've seen a lot of things. I have um, a, a, a good working understanding of this. And as research comes out, they'll be more available. There's a new paper about oxylipin 10 home, which comes from metabolism of oleic acid that increases fatigue um, in a in a model. So I think more and more, obviously, we'll we'll learn about this. And my suspicion is just, you know, <laughs> full disclosure, I feel like we're seeing NK cell suppression and then some stem cell activation suppression that leads to a lot of these, you know, problems. So when you see a young person I always, when I see a young person, like it's a combination of genetics, inflammation, in case cell suppression leads you to a malignancy that you shouldn't otherwise see at that early age. Yeah, that's interesting. And it, it makes me want to turn for a moment to, you know, how you've now really become specialized in, in longevity, helping people to optimize their health into the future. Uh, you know, tell us more about that. Is that like what, how do you, how has that become an extension of your work? Uh, it's interesting. You know, the, the book sharp is really a methodology you can use, not just for surgical recovery. It's basically to lower inflammation. So if we just think about, you know, longevity as a way to, um, obviously we we'll, we want to extend our organ life that w that's how we extend life right so if we if we certainly uh, do things that affect our brain health so having sleep apnea very bad for brain health so any of my patients who have really disturbed sleep or any of your patients who have really disturbed sleep as measured on an ultra human ring or war ring or whoop strap or apple watch or whatever go get a sleep test because if you have sleep apnea the number one thing you can do to protect your brain is to to get a CPAP. I have one, I have a narrow airway, and mm -hmm. otherwise I don't have risk factors. I'm not overweight, I exercise, you know, all the things. So two, you know, from a lung, you know, perspective, you know, certain things you can do, obviously not smoke, you know, try to be cognizant of your work environment. If you're, you know, in an industry where you're getting exposed a lot, then they should have proper gear for you you know, from a, a chemical exposure standpoint or, or a noxious stimuli standpoint, because uh, people who have limited glutathionization pathways will have more sensitivity to that. You know, cardiac and the, uh, we need cardiovascular and respiratory things will go hand in hand. But if you have, you know, APOE mutations, especially women, you're going to be more predisposed to problems with both inflammation that always you know, always think of more cardiac things um when we're you know looking at liver or kidney disease you know liver is a huge huge yeah. and it detoxifies the majority of our uh, things that we breathe or, or, or things we ingest and then the kidneys obviously do their job to filter it out so i guess you know, the way I look at it is whatever we can do to limit inflammation, knowing what we know about genetics and using our knowledge of toxins, tox bird, and coupled the air quality, you know, flu quality, uh, flu quality, food quality, I'm sorry. Those things to me, like those are the hacks for longevity. So if longevity is chronic inflammation of your brain that leads to Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or a stroke, or you get 
you know, cardiac problems and you have a heart attack or you get congestive heart failure or if you have liver dysfunction or if you have kidney dysfunction, obviously respiratory dysfunction, all those things are really end organ damage caused by chronic inflammation for the most part, we'll say. So longevity to me is basically reverse engineering treatment of inflammation. So whatever you can do, and it goes back to what we discussed earlier with how you sleep, how you eat, the fluids you take in, and the air you breathe. <laughs> so true. It's so true. And it's so worth it to pay attention to it. And whenever we figure that out, that it's, you know, that we need to make that adjustment because as you're mentioning, we can be preventing all the different causes of of not only death but also uh, health issues later in life. And so, if we can be if we can be proactive in preventing it, then that's that's going to mean we have you know more, better quality of life to enjoy. Oh my gosh! Well, wow! How how amazing and interesting! Thank you so much, Rob, for joining us, Dr. Robert Whitfield, again in his book called Sharp, which you can find on Amazon and all the places you can find books. And um, thank you so much for joining me. Is there anything else you wanted to share before we head off? Yeah, for those patients who are interested in learning more about breast implant illness. Um, we do have a podcast just devoted to breast implant illness, and we do have a YouTube channel just devoted to breast implant illness. Basically, all about education, facts, um, different uh, you know shows that I've done with patients, or I've I've done about topics. So that's just my my you know really free giveaway to everybody to help them get educated. Love it. I'll definitely put links to those in the show notes so everybody can find it easily and go learn more from your expertise. Thank you again so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me on. Oh my gosh. And thank you everyone for joining us here at How Humans Heal. Please make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. I'll see you soon. Thanks for listening to How Humans Heal. If you liked this episode, leave a rating and a review. And for more resources, visit drdonnie.com.